okay, we're going to record and then Dan, I'm going to give you host. Okay, while well, that's uh, transferring to Dan, um, I do just want to say that I'm appreciative of Dan and the work that he's been doing up to this point. Um, I actually have felt a little smarter sometimes when I watch the news in the morning and they start talking about the economy and they'll say some things. I'm like, oh, Dan, I remember Dan said that. And, <laughs> and I feel like I can kind of understand and participate a little better in that process. Um, but I do want to review for just a quick second um, because Dan's on part three. His part one was what was the impact domestic in the U.S. of the COVID uh, crisis. And then last presentation was on the international impact in different countries that were doing it right. And then the um, sort of ramifications on, on their economies. Um, and then now he's entering his third part where he's going to talk about the financial market. So it's like the stock market and so forth. Um, and the implications of COVID and what to do there. Um, and then in, in his fourth and final one will be two weeks from now, um, just to remind everybody. I did wear green because next week is St. Patty's Day. So I wanna wish everybody the luck of the Irish, you know, on March 17th, we're all Irish. And so uh, may you all have good luck next week. Dan, um, I think you are ready to go, my friend. Okay, sir. Well, thank you again, Kevin. And I uh, appreciate for all of you folks for uh, being here in the support of your colleague. And, um, and hopefully all these um, presentations are gonna be uh, worthwhile for you. So um, uh, without further ado, I'm gonna be starting on my presentation. And again, like I said, um, or as Kevin said, uh, this is my third. And perhaps some of you already uh, were on my first presentation and second one as well. Uh, we talked about the uh, uh, impact of uh, uh, COVID-19 on the U.S. Uh, economy on the first uh, uh, speech. And the second one for, was the uh, global implications of the COVID-19. And um, in, uh, this week uh, or today, I'm going to be talking about um, uh, impact of COVID-19 in financial markets. And specifically, the focus is U.S. market. Uh, so um, why I have chosen this particular topic is because uh, there are a lot of similarities between um, the impact of COVID in our financial market, the way that uh, financial crisis had impact in, our, in 2007, 2008 in our economy. And I'm sure that uh, all of you remember what happened to us in 2007, 2008, Hausen bubble, Hausen, uh, bubble uh, uh, burst, and then also the uh, uh, financial market got in trouble and all these things. And I'm going to be talking about that a little bit just to um, draw the uh, comparison uh, between what happened in 2007 and 8 uh, and what is happening today and uh, whether we're going to be seeing the same thing uh, again all over after uh, COVID. So um, uh, let's uh, go again. Uh, my introduction, I, for most of you know me, uh, my name is uh, Darius Shadi, but they uh, refer to me as Dan Shadi. All my colleagues call me Dan, so I guess I'm Dan. Um, and uh, I've been uh, uh, teaching for a long time uh, with different universities. And uh, uh, of course, uh, right now I am uh, representing uh, U.S. Uh, University, and um, I teach uh, a variety of different courses. So uh, that's about me. And uh, let's move on to the uh, presentation. <clears throat> okay. I hope everybody sees this, and uh, this is the uh, third uh, uh, speech, and I'm going to enlarge the page. Okay, here we go. Okay, so uh, again, as you uh, know, that this particular uh, scholarship uh, uh, events are uh, being uh, supported by uh, Aspen University and U.S. Uh, University, and and of course, Kevin, 
provide me the, this opportunity uh, to uh, to present some of the things that I did in my research in uh, recent uh, uh, recent year also, uh, I have to say, because it has been, uh, what, a little bit, of, uh, just about a year that we had COVID. Okay. Uh, so what are we uh, going to be uh, talking about? Uh, analyzing the financial market dynamics. Uh, it's, again, briefly, uh, examine the impact of COVID on the uh, U.S. financial markets and comparing the financial crisis of 2007-2008 to current pandemic. So those are the uh, areas I'm going to be uh, covering. And uh, this is uh, actually uh, the graph basically shows you, this is not for now, this is for 2007-2008, but it's applicable to today as well because the uh, trend is uh, almost the same. Uh, this basically shows uh, three uh, uh, trend, one basically being TED, the other one is uh, USGG 3M and uh, LIBOR. So what they are basically, uh, and again, I'm going to simplify what this is all about. TED is the credit, basically a uh, perceived credit risk in the market. So uh, the, and the, uh, the, uh, the maroon color uh, is, is uh, TED. It just basically shows how volatile the market is and how much investors are concerned about the uh, uh, credit risk, meaning uh, at, 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 at the borrow money or having uh, or lend them money, how dangerous it could be, meaning that the, uh, the uh, level of the default in payments and all these things. So, uh, in another ones, basically, uh, the library is uh, London. Uh, a, basically, it is a London interbank interest rate, and then that basically that's what it is. Uh, it, it, the whole world uses that rate to compare their own rate with, and um, and also that the uh, the uh, USDG three M is basically three months Treasury bond yield. And, and what, what's why we have all these three? Ted, of course, I told you they, they uh, created this. But the other two, basically, LIBOR is, uh, uh, well, first of all, the uh, three months treasury bill doesn't have any risk, okay? So when you have that, then that's, that's the blue one, then you could compare the other ones, meaning that Ted, the uh, credit risk, and the, the, the interbank of the London's rate, you see the differences, meaning that uh, how volatile the uh, other, other ones look when you compare it to three months um, treasury bill. So the, uh, the reason I have this here to just give you an idea that how some of these uh, risks are measured and especially at the times like this. So this is for instance for uh, 2007, as you can see, uh, from 2008-2009, the, uh, uh, the TED was highest, almost 5%. Four, actually, it is exactly 4.78. So um, what, what basically shows that it is, is an enormous amount of the uh, risk, uh, credit risk in the market. And what does that mean? It means that people um, are not uh, uh, comfortable loaning out money. Uh, just because of, uh, and again, loan of money is not necessarily the debt. Debt also includes many other uh, financial instruments like um, bond. Bond is for uh, some type of debt. So the risk on those are very high in financial crises or was high in, high in financial crises and it is high today. So later on, you're going to see that uh, how much this comparison uh, is vital and important uh, and critical. So, uh, let's, uh, before we talk about um, uh, the uh, impact of COVID on US economy, it is uh, important for us to understand uh, the um, uh, financial crisis of 2007 and eight. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time on it because uh, I'm hoping that particular uh, event and my discussions about it provide you some perspective as to uh, how 
impact in our uh, financial markets. And what we are uh, worried or concerned to see in the future, are we going to be seeing something similar to financial crises at the end of tunnel with COVID impact, or is it going to be different? Uh, so uh, let's talk about the financial crisis of 2007-2008. And uh, basically, all these uh, happened uh, because of the concern that Federal Reserve had in uh, 1999. Believe it or not, the financial crisis actually started uh, at, uh, uh, on 1999 uh, just because uh, Federal Reserve basically was uh, uh, very concerned about um, the state of economy. And what was the concern here is that our economy was growing uh, for uh, uh, some economists say nine years, some other economists say even 12 years uh, uh, consecutively. And, um, and this is unusual, meaning that if the economy grows for 12 years, that is a very sign of, uh, uh, it's a red flag, is a sign of danger. Why? because we know that economic life cycle, normally expansion in average is between four to four and a half years, okay? And recession is the same uh, period of same duration, meaning that between uh, four to four and a half years, sometime less than that. So now we have what, 12 years of growth? What does that mean? Well, it means that uh, it's like roller coaster ride. Higher you climb, harder you're gonna fall. That's the logic. So we have uh, uh, climbing uh, a high for 12 years. So are we gonna be tumbling down very hard? The answer is yes. As we did, by the way. So, um, and what, what was the re reason behind that uh, uh, extraordinary growth was uh, the explosion of the information technology, basically. And um, uh, so, so what is the concern here? The concern here that we're going to come down very hard. Therefore, Federal Reserve and Federal Government, in cooperation with Federal Government, they decided to do something about it before the full impact uh, is felt by the economy, by the society. So they cannot be silent about it. They cannot just sit aside and say, watch to see what happens. They have to do something about it. So what they normally do is that, uh, uh, well, obviously Federal Reserve uses um, its own tools. What are those tools? Well, obviously we know that they have uh, uh, interest rates. Basically they are in charge of federal funds rate, which is the base for all the interest rates. And also they have the uh, required reserve ratios of the bankings, and also they have ability to um, buy and sell treasury securities. So those are the three tools that they have available. In, uh, and obviously the most often used tool is interest rates. Just because imagine that, uh, it, again, I'm not gonna go to the uh, details of it, but imagine that, if the economy is in recession, what, what is the best tool to fix that? Well, provide money to uh, people and uh, uh, firms, organizations. And how this is possible? Well, uh, uh, drop the rates and make money available. And people are gonna be having the tendency to borrow. When they borrow, they're gonna either invest it or spend it. And that's what we wanna see. So therefore, uh, interest rate, so federal fair funds rate is the most effective tool of the Federal Reserve, and they use that. And they said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to be dropping the rates uh, as much as we possibly can and uh, encouraging people to go ahead and uh, borrow money. And when they borrow money, obviously they're going to have uh, money and they're going to be um, spending and investing all these things. So 
uh, why they were wanted to do this, basically they wanted to have kind of a safety net, a kind of a buffer, kind of a cushion, cushion for the economy because we know it's coming down. It's like imagine that you're an airplane and God forbid airplane is crashing. What is the next best thing to do? Well, grab a parachute. This policy was a parachute, basically. So what they did basically was uh, 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 drop the rates, obviously. They dropped the rates, uh, the, the rates were in December. And I know some of these because I wrote a paper about a long time ago when this happened. Uh, and I uh, remember some of the numbers, believe it or not. So uh, for instance, December of 1999, the uh, federal funds rate was 6.48, which is, you know, kind of high. And they dropped this, they dropped this uh, 12 times, half a percent every quarter. By 2003, this rate became 1%. On the other hand, uh, as we learn now, as we learned that uh, having the lower interest rate, not necessarily is gonna be putting money in hands of the majority of the people. Why not? Because it could be cheap, but it may not be available. So what does that mean? It means that what we experienced in uh, 2010, 11, 12, 13, that uh, the rates were zero but you couldn't borrow money. Banks were not willing to loan you money. And the reason being is that they were coming out of financial crises and they didn't want to deal with the same thing again. However, how are we going to be making the money? Well, we're going to make the money cheap, Fred Reserve says, but how are we going to make it available? Okay, well, here comes the federal government. Federal government basically could uh, make the um, uh, some of the regulations uh, kind of um, uh, go away. Meaning what? Meaning that they lax in some of the lending practices for banks. Meaning that hey, you don't have to really uh, select the qualified people to give him the money. Basically, you could give money to anybody with pulse. That's what it means. So um, Graham uh, uh, Leach uh, by Lily uh, is, is it was the uh, act that basically uh, prevented the banks to do some of these. Uh, actually, they uh, that law passed in 1999 to um, kind of uh, dismiss um, Glass Siegel. Act that was passed on in Great Depression uh, times uh, to uh, to lax some of these uh, uh, or dismiss those uh, some of those uh, high regulation and restrictions. Basically, that's in a in a simple way of saying. So uh, it, it was uh, 1999. They passed this law, and this act enabled uh, financial institutions, especially the commercial banks to loan out money with no, not much of restriction. Basically, you could loan out to anybody they want with no uh, guidelines, with no uh, restrictions. So as a result, what happened? Of course, you could guess. That's what happened is what we experienced. Uh, basically, uh, all the uh, banks, they uh, loaned uh, money to people who were not qualified and they created subprime loans. And of course you understand uh, subprime, what the subprime is. Prime borrower is qualified borrower and subprime borrower is a not qualified borrower. So they create a lot of subprime loans. Um, so what happens to happen here again, uh, I talked about some of these and yeah, Glass uh, Siegel Act of 1999 that was basically dismissed in uh, 1999 by the federal government to make sure that money is available to everybody. So uh, uh, obviously borrowers rush to take advantage and, uh, of the available money, cheap and available money and bank issued uh, subprime loans. And uh, what we know today, they were all creative loans. 
uh, in uh, the creative means that some of them basically uh, were interest alone loans, some of them were uh, like three years or five years fixed, and the rest uh, adjustable loans and uh, arms and all these. And uh, these were basically, if you think about it, when bank issues subprime loans, bank knows that somehow most of these priors, I'm sorry, borrowers are going to be uh, uh, defaulting in their loan. They know that. So how are we going to deal with this? Well, how are you going to deal with this? You're not going to have people borrow money uh, with the low rate fixed for 15 years or 30 years. You're not going to do that because they know you're going to default. So give them ARBs, give them adjustable rates, give them uh, interest only uh, uh, loans, uh, give them ninja loans. Anybody knows what ninja loan is? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of funny because ninja actually stands for a uh, uh, description of the borrower. Uh, no income, no job or asset. That is uh, ninja. So they gave up money to people with that kind of uh, uh, conditions so, and qualifications. So basically, uh, you could imagine what, what was the result of all these. Uh, People are borrowing money. And again, think about it, folks. This is very important for us to understand that about our, if there, you know, I mean, understanding human nature, that's what I'm trying to uh, convey here, is that it's very, almost impossible. Well, if you offer cheap money to anybody, and what I mean by cheap money is that money that has a lowest interest rate, Especially the people, uh, you know, in middle class or uh, so, or uh, the people that are not extremely wealthy. Let's put it that way. They're going to accept it. That's human nature. Even if I'm not qualified for that uh, loan, still I'm going to say, "Yeah, I like to have it." It's like what happened is that uh, those days they were uh, showing people, okay, yeah, well. This is important. I forgot to tell you this. Uh, what was the intention of Federal Reserve at the time when they dropped the rate? This is again something very much connected to what I'm talking about here. It was uh, targeting the housing market because we know for a fact that the lower uh, lower and interest rates. Uh, directly are going to be is going to be uh, impacting the housing market number one and then other industries as well. And there is a positive relationship between uh, interest rates and housing market. We know that. So therefore, when they dropped the rates, they were targeting the housing industry. And why they're targeting the housing industry? Because if we stimulate housing industry, we increase the, uh, or we make the housing industry uh, to thrive, all the, all the other industries that are directly connected to housing industry or indirectly connected to housing industry, they're going to thrive as well. Increasing the um, housing market uh, is going to increase the whole economy or the growth of the housing market, I should say, uh, also create growth of the uh, entire economy. Why? Because housing market, first of all, directly uh, connected to many industries like banking, like uh, transportation, like lumber, like uh, furniture, and many, many other industries that are directly connected to housing. So if you make the housing uh, industry to grow, basically all those other industries that are directly connected to housing industry are going to be growing. On top of that, if you think about it, many industries that are not even directly connected to housing industry, they're going to be impacted positively if the housing in, uh, industry grows. How? Well, imagine that if you have a hamburger joint someplace in, uh, in San Diego and you see the new project, uh, new, uh, new housing building project going on in different parts of the town, 
guess what? You're going to be uh, very much encouraged to also open another hamburger joint in those new neighborhoods. And that's exactly what we see. Uh, you go to the new uh, neighborhood and you're going to see, I mean, uh, you new house and uh, project, you buy a new house or brand new house in, um, and you see that many companies move in there as soon as you move in, in that neighborhood. So port. Uh, therefore, we're talking about the housing industry being impacted drastically. And here we have all these loans provided to people. So what are they going to be doing? They're going to be investing in housing market because majority of the people's biggest inv investment is housing. And if the banks are willing to pay, uh, give you uh, any amount uh, with no restrictions, no qualification uh, requirement, uh, you're going to borrow money and most likely you're going to invest in, in housing market. Okay, so uh, as a result, what happened here, as you could imagine, that uh, 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 many people uh, uh, defaulted in their loans. And again, what, one of the reasons that caused that default for majority of the people was that, uh, remember what I said, the loans that were given out, they were not fixed loans for uh, 15, 30 years or whatnot. They were uh, most of them adjustable and interest only loans. So guess what? The moment the, uh, the federal funds aid interest rates increased, they got in trouble, as it did. Uh, federal uh, Reserve in, uh, increased the rates uh, from 1%, which was on two, two, 2003, to 5.4% uh, by 2005. And you may say, why in the world they want to do that? Well, because of the fear of inflation, because they knew that if they kept this particular lower lay, uh, rate and people rush to the banks to borrow all kinds of money and spend and invest, especially in the housing market, we're going to be creating inflation. And actually, uh, not even inflation, hyperinflation. So meaning what? Meaning that basically uh, uh, too much money, and this is the, you know, I mean, when you uh, uh, pump up and inject this kind of money to society, as we are doing right now, uh, the biggest fear is uh, hyperinflation, because that's the best recipe for a hyperinflation, excessive amount of the money in circulation, basically. Uh, so because of that Federal Reserve, adjusted the rates, brought it to 5.4. And from that point on, all the people who had uh, adjustable uh, loans, adjustable uh, rates, guess what? Uh, the rate increased drastically. And when the inc uh, rate increased drastically, obviously they are not going to be able to pay. Some people were thinking that, okay, let's, let's do that. Let's buy the house. Yeah, we're not qualified. You may not be able to sustain the house, but we're going to be, what we're going to be doing, we could uh, sell the house and get the equity on of it after a couple of years or a few years after down the road. Uh, and again, that was a wrong assumption. Because the moment housing market, the foreclosures happened, the housing market came down. Guess what? The price of them also came down. So what are we talking about? What are we talking about if you bought a house for $500,000? That house is no longer worth $500,000. And so you cannot pay your payments and you cannot sell the house. What are you going to do? You're going to walk away. That's exactly what happened. So people walked away from their homes. So when they walk away from their homes, what happens basically? Banks end up uh, having a bunch of broken house, houses. And, uh, and when that happens uh, is uh, basically banks uh, get in trouble. Why? Because they have loaned out uh, billions of dollars in, um, in uh, people are not capable of paying back their uh, uh, payments on their loans. Uh, and, they, uh, and they walk away. And by the way, those are the houses that now they have less value from the day that they were purchased. So banks are about to or stand to lose a lot, and they did.
Citibank lost $2 billion on the first quarter of 2007, followed by Bank of America and all these major banks. So this was the beginning of the, all the things that we experienced in um, financial crisis of 2007, 2008. However, one thing that we need to understand is uh, what banks normally do with, um, uh, with our houses. Now, first of all, we have to think about this, and I'm sure that you know this. Uh, when you borrow money from bank, uh, what do you got? You got bank's money. But what does bank have? Bank has your what? House. So you're not the owner of your house. Bank is owner of your house until you what? Pay off your loan. Then it becomes all yours. So the point that I'm making here, banks, when they have that kind of assets, real assets, houses, and again, let's suppose I'm Bank of America, and I do, I have already loaned out, uh, I don't know, $10 billion. And I have all I have all these, but people do have my 10 billion. They have my money. But what, what do I have? I have those thousands of houses that legally they belong to me. Banks not only make money on the interest that you're paying for your loan, but they make good money also by securitization of your uh, homes, your houses. And what do I mean by that? Like I said, um, let's suppose on Bank of America, I loaned out $10 billion, I own those houses. So those are real assets. I could securitize it. What does securitization mean? Meaning that I could convert these uh, real assets to financial assets. Meaning what? Meaning that I could issue bonds that are backed by these houses, basically. And banks do that. So basically they issue bond and they sell it and raise money. And uh, uh, basically uh, bonds are called mortgage-backed securities, MBSs, and also CDO. CDOs uh, basically is a little bit different. CDO stands for collateralized obligation. What this basically means is that uh, these are all packages, if you will. What they do is for as an MBS, mortgage-backed security, they bundle this. They bundle a bunch of loans that are backed by the what? Mortgages, obviously, you could uh, uh, imagine. And, uh, and those um, mortgages basically are in different um, uh, uh, level as far as the uh, uh, credit that is assigned to them, meaning that it's prime loans, subprime loans, uh, in somewhere in between loans. So some of those loans, uh, are obviously, uh, when they put it in a bundle, it becomes a package and it has a different trenches. And trenches means that they are subprime, prime, and all these stuff. When they bundle it, they sell it, meaning that they, they issue the uh, uh, bonds. But when they sell those, um, basically, uh, banks or, or the issuer of these bonds get money. And obviously MBS is not only, or it's, they are not necessarily all the time bonds, but also it could be, I'm not gonna go to, go to the, the details of it, but also could be in the form of stocks and the stocks is in meaning that if uh, let's say uh, the buyer of these uh, uh, MBS is, let's say if, if it's an uh, insurance company or if it was a pension fund company, what they do is they get this bonds and they uh, uh, create a private equity company and then pay, and they, they put the, all this money in that private equity and private equity company could issue their own stocks and uh, sell it in the market. So it is a lot of compl uh, complex uh, process in here. But the point that I'm making is at this time in, in regard to our financial crisis, uh, MBS has created CDOs, and CDOs are a little bit different because CDOs are all, also the trenches of the loans and mortgage mortgages, plus other financial assets. Uh, so it's a combination of many, many things. Who buys these stuff? 
The buyer of these uh, MBSs and CDOs are, uh, well, mostly MBSs are um, pension fund companies, pension fund companies, insurance companies, uh, uh, mutual fund companies, hedge fund companies. And these are all the companies that they buy these bonds because they have these bonds, normally they have lower level of risk. And, uh, and uh, because of that, of course, it's as you know, that for the pension fund company, this is very important uh, to, uh, to invest people's uh, money from their paycheck, from the companies that they contribute for their, let's say 401k or whatnot, this pension or, or, or pension or, or uh, retirement funds, I should, I should say. Uh, the, the, it's important for the, uh, uh, this uh, pension fund companies not to lose this money. Actually, their priority is that they invest this money and create a portfolio for their uh, companies and the people, employees, that these portfolios are almost 100% uh, safe, no risk associated with it, or, Z, uh, or very low risk associated with it because they cannot afford to lose this money because it's not their money, it's other people's money. When they retire, they have to get their money. Anyways, so what is my point about bringing this, all these to your attention? When they issue bonds, folks, bonds are unknown commodities for many people, many investors. Because first of all, everybody can buy issue bonds. As long as you have the permission from SEC, uh, Security Exchange Commission, you could issue bond. Bond basically is a promising note. Meaning that you give me your money, I'll give you this piece of, piece of paper, and I give you interest on it till it becomes matured or uh, the date that I have to pay back your money. Basically, that's it, that's, that's bond. So here, we have thousands of different bonds with thousands of different uh, uh, provisions. If you're the, you're the one who's investing in bond, how do you know this bond is good, it has lower risk or is uh, bad, high risk, and all these things, you don't. So because of that, we have established some agencies in the market to rate these bonds. And when they rate these bonds, basically, you have the confidence what you're buying. For instance, uh, agencies like Moody's, Standard Poor, and Fitch, those are the three major rating agencies in the United States for bonds. So my point is that if I'm buying a bond, is it rated triple A or is rated the, the triple B or is uh, under C, which be referred to as a junk bond? No, that doesn't mean that I don't, I'm not gonna buy junk bond, but it means that I know what I'm getting into. I know what I'm buying. Some people buy junk bond. Why? Because they want to balance their portfolio. So meaning that I have a bunch of uh, dollar stocks. So I have a lot of conservative stocks. I have a lot of treasury securities in my portfolio. Now I want to put some flair in it. So I want to put some heat on it. So I buy junk bond because junk bonds has what? They have high risk, but what? High return. And that's the, that's the uh, very basic um, trade-off in the market. Normally high risk yields you what? High return. So I know what I'm buying. And if I buy a triple A bond, I'm buying a bond that is not gonna be giving me a lot of high rate of return, but it's gonna give me security in mind, meaning, meaning that they, has, uh, they have a very, very low risk. Now, having said that, what happened in the time of financial crises? All these MBSs that issued by these banks, knowing the fact that majority of the people borrow those money, they're subprime borrowers, and they're gonna be defaulting in their loans, 
They asked the Moody's and Standard Poor's to rate all of these as triple A instead of uh, rating them as junk bond. That's what had happened. Why Moody's did that? Because their biggest customer was Bank of America, Wells Fargo, and many other big major banks. They couldn't go against them. Did they lie to us? Oh, you betcha. And again, this is not Danish Hardy's opinion, please. Because after the dust settled, all these agencies, all these banks were fined by Department of Justice in terms of billions of dollars. They were all fine to be guilty. It's not my opinion, folks. Bank of America had two cases. One seat, they paid $5 billion. The other one, a little bit over $5 billion because they found to be uh, cheating the uh, uh, people in those uh, times, all the illegal activities. Wells Fargo, the same way. Citibank, the same way. Standard Poor, the same way. Billions of dollars, they're all fined guilty. Even the Deutsche Bank of Germany was fined $2 billion. I think it was $2 billion. Why? Because they were hiding Bank of America's money those days. So, point. Point is the disaster because of all these. Who are buying all these uh, 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 junk bonds under the uh, AAA ratings. They're big investment banks. Like I said, we're talking about uh, uh, pension fund companies, insurance companies, mutual fund companies, hedge fund companies, investment banks like, like uh, I, uh, uh, AIG, like uh, 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 Lehman Brothers, like uh, 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 Bear Stearns, like uh, Mayor Lynch, like all those big, big names. Uh, those were the purchasers of all these. And guess what's happening now? <laughs> uh, they bought these bonds under the assumption that they are uh, AAA, but they are actually John Paul. And again, I'm kind of making this a little bit more simplified and very melodramatic, but it, there's a lot of other stuff involved here. But this is the bottom. This is all in nutshell, if you will, folks. So what do we have here? We have all these major, major institutions, financial institutions, got in trouble. They're filing bankruptcy. They're, they're not surviving the market. So. Uh, Dan, just, just a heads up, you have about 15 minutes. This is just a pace marker, just to give you a, uh, a checkpoint. Thank you. Um, so they got in trouble. Obviously, uh, we know the outcome. Lehman Brothers uh, went out of business. Uh, AIG was uh, uh, bailed out by, uh, by Treasury Department. Uh, Mary Lynch was bought up with Bank of America, uh, JP Morgan was bought up with Chase and all these stuff, meaning, meaning that all these uh, major big companies uh, basically uh, suffered. And obviously, uh, we, we start seeing the unemployment, we start seeing the uh, people, millions of people losing their uh, uh, jobs, millions of people losing their house, millions of people losing their life savings. That was the outcome of financial crisis. Now, let's move on. Um, uh, uh, here again, uh, very briefly, we cannot let the financial market to go uh, uh, down the drain, meaning that we cannot let major uh, players in the financial market to go bankrupt. If, if they do, the whole economy, the whole nation is going to go bankrupt. Financial institutions are the backbone of the entire economy. So what we had what we, we had to do, what federal government did those days, they come up with uh, many, many uh, bailout plans. Uh, the most important one uh, was TARP, Trouble Asset Relief, uh, Relief Program. But uh, uh, basically, we end up spending like uh, $1.2 trillion to get ourselves out of the mess. Now, uh, 
what is the uh, comparison today? The comparison of what happened to us in the financial crisis of 2007, 2008, we see it's repeating itself. Are we gonna have the same outcome? Uh, nobody knows, but we see the same trend. Again, we're seeing a bunch of people rushing to the banks to borrow money. We see a bunch of people who are not again prime borrowers are capable of borrowing money. Why? Because of many reasons that happened in 2007. L rates are extremely low. Right now, currently, federal funds rate is one quarter of 1%. That's almost zero. Banks are willing to loan you money with very, very low interest rates. Mortgage rates are extremely low. And guess what? People are rushing to get money. And uh, where this most of this money is going to be going toward housing again. Today, you see that. Today, you see that housing market is uh, thriving. Growing fast. Demand for housing is extremely high these days. And the inventory is extremely low because housing market, in order to catch up with the demand, they have to build houses. And the building houses takes time. And that's what's happening. Inventory low, demand is high. Therefore, the price of houses are skyrocketing. 10% in uh, the uh, beginning of this year. And it was like 6% by last uh, fourth quarter of last year. That's a, that's a great, I mean, that's a lot of <laughs> appreciation in house values, 10%. So where are we heading with this? Are we gonna be seeing again people buying these houses and all of a sudden many of these houses, again, banks are gonna do the same thing. They're gonna do securitization and they're gonna be issuing bonds and all this setting it to, and again, uh, we don't know uh, if they're gonna do the same thing based on the experience they had in 2007. But the assumption is that we're saying the same trend. People are gonna, again, some of them, they're gonna fail and pay in their payments. They're gonna default on their loans. Some house is going to go to foreclosures. Market is going to be saturated by new uh, 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 production of houses just because they are built in very fast. Uh, folks, uh, just pay attention out there. In each neighborhood, you're going to, you're going to be seeing new house and uh, project is going on these days. All over. They want to catch up. And much market is going to be saturated. Price of the houses are going to be dropping in all these things and uh, are we seeing the same thing? That's a major question. Uh, impact on, uh, uh, well, COVID impact on uh, housing, uh, I'm sorry, stock market. Uh, voluntary exists between the, uh, uh, well, obviously we know that uh, uh, market is volatile when, uh, when we have crises. Um, uh, However, it was more, uh, the volatility was more in uh, European countries and other countries than it was in the United States. And uh, the reason being is that um, many of the um, uh, policies here, here in our country, they bestowed confidence in, uh, in investors. And therefore, the uh, uh, market was not as volatile as, uh, as many other places. And this, uh, this basically, what was the uh, policies here in the United States, as we discussed it in previous speeches, that it was the actions of Federal Reserve and Federal Government uh, in their uh, prompt reaction to market. Folks, remember, by, by, uh, I don't remember exactly, but it was like early part of 2020, we uh, start um, pumping money to the society through the uh, uh, federal government's uh, uh, different uh, uh, bailout pack, or I'm sorry, stimulus packages like uh, CARES uh, package that uh, distribute money to uh, 
uh, PPP loans and uh, direct checks for everybody and all those. That was like uh, uh, last year. And they promptly acted toward this. When they did that, stock market felt a little bit confident. And uh, the uh, volatility was not as much as we expected uh, to be in the market. And on top of that, uh, there were some other elements, some of the factors playing a role. One of them was the row or the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the strength of dollar. Normally times like this, uh, the dollar uh, or cur currency of any countries when they supply a lot of money to the economy, the value of the money currency of the country declines because there's too much money in, in, the, uh, in the economy. Therefore, too much of everything in uh, supply of too, uh, excessive supply of anything to bring the value of that thing down, we know that. So with the assumption that we are pumping this kind of trillions of dollars to the economy, uh, the, the dollar is going to lose the strength in the market, and that's going to also concern the investors in the stock market. But it didn't happen that way. Why it didn't happen? Because many other countries around the world, they, when they saw this crisis, they wanted to uh, invest their, uh, well, basically have their reserves in form of dollar rather than currency of other countries, even their own country. So uh, what, what, what this means is means that um, dollar internationally had increased in demand by many countries who want to keep their reserves uh, in the central bank of uh, uh, countries uh, in form of dollar. So dollar did not lose value much. <clears throat> Voluntary, uh, volatility index, as you can see it in this particular graph, is, uh, and this is for 2007. Uh, okay, I'm, uh, I don't see it here, but anyways, uh, yeah, 2011, 12. Uh, however, this, uh, this is not to show you what, what's going on right now. It shows you that how we measure volatility index, and then and, and obviously when it goes up, it means the, more, the market is more volatile and so forth, so on. So let's move on with a very limited time. <clears throat> uh, one of the things that people do not really realize is that when they think that uh, economy is in trouble and we have financial crises, that necessarily it means that the stock market is going to crash and people are going to be selling their stocks, dumping the stocks, and invest, reinvesting their money in other uh, instruments like uh, gold or whatnot. And that is not necessarily true, because the stock market basically does not operate based on the economic indicators and uh, 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 complete information. The stock market basically operates based on the speculation. And the speculation is based on what? Asymmetric information. And what we're talking about is that many people, they buy and sell stocks based on what? Very incomplete information or uh, based on their own speculation. For instance, if uh, we have a, uh, uh, at, at the time, let's say, uh, the uh, ex-president uh, Trump, they, uh, he imposed tariffs in uh, China. Uh, so what happened? Uh, of course, many think that uh, we could uh, expect from it. However, in the stock market, how they looked at it, oh my God, you know, here we go. Uh, put in a tariff in, in, in uh, uh, importations of the uh, China is going to create the trade uh, war and the trade war is going to be impacting many other industries, specifically farming industry, agriculture industry. So let's dump all these uh, uh, future uh, uh, contract and the future market of the agriculture industry. Let's just sell the stocks of all the uh, soybeans and other things. You know, that's how they operate by speculation. 
So because of that, uh, the stock market goes up, goes down. These days, it's no different than any other time. Because when, when we see this uh, stimulus package or the, let's say relief uh, package of um, uh, Mr. Biden, uh, 1.9 trillion is approved. Oh my God, the stock market boom, goes up. Next day, another information comes along that, yeah, well, our PPs are not going to be uh, uh, given that much money or, or uh, the minimum wage is not going to be increased, uh, increasing to $15. Guess what? The stock market uh, reacts to it negatively. Therefore, uh, the, looking at the stock market, um, these events are uh, based on uh, just the asymmetric information and the volatility of the market is based on that. However, long-term uh, stability of the market, stock market is based on the economic stability. That should not be mistaken. <clears throat> uh, Folks, I don't think I do have time to go through this Federal Reserve's uh, actions and uh, what they did uh, to our economy. But what I'll do is I promise you next uh, speech, I'll just cover what I couldn't cover today, which is not much, uh, just a few things about Federal Reserve and how they deal uh, or how they dealt with our uh, um, economy in the times of uh, pandemic and also the conclusion of uh, why we talked about the financial crisis of 2007, what are the similarities uh, of uh, that event with the current event and uh, what we expect to see in the future. I will talk about that um, uh, next uh, uh, speech, I think it'll be a couple of weeks from now. And, um, but at this time, uh, just because I'm out of time, I'm gonna be given uh, opportunity for some of you if you have any questions by all means go ahead by the way dan um it's okay to still have a little bit hanging to cover in the next presentation because remember these this is one gigantic topic we're just breaking it into four pieces and sometimes the pieces are different sizes so um, it also sometimes help when we are carrying over something from the previous and while we think it's a carryover it actually reconnects and reactivates prior knowledge from that and now makes an easier connection for the people when they hear the new knowledge so uh, don't see that necessarily as a bad thing okay let's um open it up to chat anybody have a question or just we have a small enough group you can unmute your mic if you have a question for uh, dan about anything he presented today Dan, I do have a, a question, I guess, in general, because um, you talked a lot about how some of the things that you're noticing now and the way either we're responding or the market is behaving or the way our government is doing certain things that was similar to uh, some of the unfavorable events that occurred in the 2008 crisis. And the worry again, are we now heading down that same path here where soon in the next year, there may be a problem, for example, with housing um, because people are negatively impacted maybe by uh, losing their job and therefore they can't make payments. And now all of a sudden the market is flooded with a whole bunch of houses. And what used to be valued at 300,000 is now only valued at 200,000 because there's too many of them on the market. So interesting observation that you made there. My question for you then is um, based on your uh, knowledge of that and your confidence levels and your awareness of the economy, should someone sell their house this year or next year? Or should they buy a house this year or next year? What, what are the advantages or disadvantages of either of those moves this year or next year? Uh, it's simple. First of all, right now, as we are speaking, sell your house if you all have the intention of selling. Because right now, houses are going skyrocketing, right? Just like this, if you put a trend on it. Is that going to be peaking pretty soon? Yep, uh, uh, undoubtedly, uh, and eventually it has to. Uh, so it's time to sell your house. It's not a good time to buy because they, the people, even if it's said that the percentages is like 10% increase, just because I, as a seller, no, the houses are increasing in value. When you offer me five hundred thousand dollars, I'm going no, no, six hundred. Therefore, it's best time to sell. However, 
uh, how long this is going to be continue on? Uh, my my prediction is when we see the completion of the new housing projects and when they come to market, that's going to fulfill the uh, excessive demand in the market. Therefore, the housing uh, prices are going to be tapering. In, uh, in let's suppose that, uh, again, don't quote me on that, but my uh, uh, forecast is by end of the summer, housing market is not going to have any increase in value. So from that point on, it's a good time to buy. All righty. See, this is the value of knowing the economy and how the stock market works. <laughs> when to pull the trigger and when not to, right? Yep, exactly. Okay. And again, Kevin, these are many of these are common knowledge. Believe me, I mean everybody knows that. Hey, stock market. I mean, the housing market is increasing the value and all these stuff. Obviously, yeah. Now, supply and demand explains a lot. Uh, does exactly. anybody else have additional questions or comments or anything that they would like to ask Dan while he's here? Okie dokie. Well. Um, in two weeks from now, the day's the ninth, so 14 days will be the 23rd of March, Dan will present his part four, which will be the final chapter of this speaker series. Um, and we will move on uh, to a third presenter um, who is also from uh, the business and technology field, uh, but he's at Aspen and he's gonna talk about coactive teaching, or I'm sorry, coactive coaching uh, within the field. Um, so we'll be transitioning from Dan's into a new a presenter here in the next month or so, but Dan has one more part. Um, I've been really excited to see many of the same names occurring, so um, I hope you are finding value in this. This is obviously not required, but it is encouraged because it is an opportunity for us to come out and support our peers who are experts, and I mean, I just learned now that <laughs> go sell a house or don't buy a house or doing this other stuff. <laughs> Just by attending this and that one little, you know, 20 minute, 30 minute presentation on the housing market section there may have saved me tens of thousands of dollars uh, just by knowing when to pull that trigger. So anyway, everybody have a good rest of your week. Um, I will uh, save this and send it around and put it on the website and then I'll re-advertise uh, Dan's fourth part uh, series. Um, as that approaches. Everybody have a good rest of your week and take care. Thank you for your Thank time. you, folks. Thank you for showing up. I appreciate it. Take care of yourselves. Bye, Dan. Thank you.